René Descartes in the 17th century was the, really the founder of thinking about consciousness in the brain. And his theory said there's actually two distinct substances. There's the mind and then there's the brain. And the brain is a physical, mechanical system, material system. And the mind, well, he didn't say it floated nearby, but he might as well say that. He, he never could quite say where it was. But what happens is that, uh, here's his diagram, the uh, uh, light bounces off that arrow on the right into the man's eyes, which causes uh, the nerves to jangle, which causes cerebral, spinocerebral fluid to uh, get uh, vibrate, which causes the pineal gland to do what? Well, to send a mysterious immaterial signal to the soul. The pineal gland was Descartes' Bluetooth to the soul. <laughs> And then the soul, having decided of its own free will to point at the arrow, sends another Bluetooth signal back to the body, and that gets the arm to raise to point to the arrow. Now, this is a hopeless theory, and it has been recognized as hopeless for, by just about everybody for 50 years and more. Uh, certainly in the 21st century, there are hardly any Cartesian dualists left around, two substances, the mind and the brain. Rather, we think that the brain, it is the mind. The mind is what the brain does. It's a material organ, just as your lungs and your heart are material organs, and we have to explain all the goings on in the mind in terms of the interactions of those material parts, those 86 billion neurons that are attached to each other and sending all those signals. How many of you think that the most important thing in life is having more grandparents, grandchildren, having more grandchildren than your neighbors? <laughs> Not a single hand goes up. That's a stupendous biological fact. There is no other species on the planet that does not have that as its ultimate sumum bonum. Those swant salmon swimming upstream, they can't think, you know, I'd really rather study French literature, you know, the heck. <laughs> Kids, forget it. Yeah. No, we're the only species that has found the sort of conceptual leverage to see other prospects of this sort. This is an amazing fact about us. Maybe there's, an, there's a limit to the things that we uh, we are able to grasp. Maybe, well, but, but who knows? But, but, but wait a minute. You don't know. You, you right. have to you, you have to appreciate. I think that uh, it's not bra one brain at a time. Mm -hmm. right. right. It's teams of brains and all of science. I look. I, I'm sure, without the benefit of the of thousands of scientists and philosophers who've worked over over the eons. I'd be unable to understand all sorts of really simple things. The fact, the fact is that I can benefit from all their hard-won understanding means that I can understand things. I like to, to point out that, that my grandchildren can easily understand concepts that my parents' generation were baffled by. Yeah, right. And now, of course, there may be limits, but it's not as if we're facing a stone wall somewhere. Mm -hmm. The idea that there's somewhere where there's this stone wall and we're just going to hit blank incomprehension when we get there, it's not biological. It's, it's mystical. It's the idea that there is no trajectory through book land and science land that gets you there. And how did all this originate? And the answer to that is, well, it originated all fairly recently by geological or biological standards, religion is very young. It's only been around for maybe tens of thousands of years. It's younger than language, and that's been around hard to say. Some people think a million years, some people think a few hundred thousand years. Agriculture is 10,000 years old. The oldest known organized religion, Judaism, is only 2,000 years old. 
there's no there's no well known well understood religion that we can go back more than about three thousand years. That's that's very young, and and of course a lot of the religions are much younger. Uh, the Mormons, very recent religion. And we know that religions are born, sects are born every day. The websites can't keep up with them. Most of them last a few weeks or a few months or maybe a year or two and then go extinct. We don't know how many thousands, how many tens of thousands of religions have come and gone in the last hundred thousand years. Maybe it's millions, gone without a trace. But some have survived and flourished and leave a very big footprint on the world. And the question is why? What is it about them as natural phenomena that's permitted them to have the staying power, the stamina, the robustness, the growth? These are questions that you can ask as a, as a historian, as a, as a, as a theologian, as a, as a psychologist, as an archaeologist. You can also ask them as a biologist. This is, these facts are perfectly visible to the natural sciences. It's hard to know whether the natural sciences can do anything to study them. I want to say, in fact, they can. These are, these are good questions that a biologist should scratch his or her head about and see what they come up with. Not just biologists, but biologists among others. The trouble with the word consciousness, with the concept of consciousness, is that not only is there no agreed upon definition, people don't want to agree on a definition. Because a lot of people want consciousness to turn out to be whatever it is that is just so supercalifragilisticexpialidocious <laughs> that, that it defies science. <laughs> and, it, and anybody who puts forward a theory of consciousness which says, oh, and by the way, it's a biological phenomenon. It's, you know, it's very wonderful. It's, but then so is reproduction, so is self-repair, so is blood clotting, so is metabolism. Uh, for a lot of people, if you take that view on consciousness, you know, the, I often put it, you know, it turns out that consciousness is not one big trick, it's a bag of tricks. And it's not something that sunders the universe into the things that have it and the things that don't. You know, and the, the, the question, gee, I wonder if starfishes are, starfish are conscious, or maybe mice, or maybe how about ants or cockroaches? And they think there's this magic dividing line somewhere you know, between the oak tree and the human being where, bingo, the consciousness starts. I think that very idea, which is deeply ingrained in the thinking of many people who, as I say, think that consciousness divides the universe in two. You either got it or you don't. Right. The idea and that I, suddenly the light goes and, on. And that idea is an artifact of bad imagining right there. And we have to get rid of that idea, and we have to get people to recognize, as long as you insist on that as, as a sort of a defining characteristic of consciousness, then you, you get your wish, we'll never have a theory right. of consciousness. But abandon that idea and start looking at what different kinds of consciousness or so-called consciousness or hemi-semi-demi consciousness. As soon as you start getting out of that essentialist mode, and looking for the dividing line, then consciousness is a very real family of phenomena, not a, not a single phenomenon, a family of phenomena. In other words, there are a lot of ideas, cultural ideas, items of culture, that hijack our brains, that enter our brains, and then reproduce, make more copies. We rehearse them over and over and over again. We think about them, say them again, reflect on them, and then we pass them on to our neighbor. Some ideas do this better than others. They have offspring, that have offspring, that have offspring. This gives us a different perspective on human culture and on human religion. Uh, somebody wrote me the other day saying, well, I've, I've, I've looked at your, your book now, and I think what you're really talking about in every case, you're talking about social thinking. You're talking about persuading others. It's, it's very much uh, interpersonal. Uh, and I wrote back and said, yes, and in fact, I should have stressed that more. All really serious thinking is interpersonal, I think. I think that's, in fact, one of the keys to how 
we think is by challenging each other with our ideas. Lovely case in point, Andrew Wiles proved Fermat's last theorem a few years back, but nobody could be sure, even Wiles himself couldn't be sure he'd done it until his peers, his colleagues in mathematics, who would dearly love to have the honor of having proved Fermat's last theorem themselves, until they had signed off and said, darn it, yes, he's got it, congratulations. This competitive opponent process between people is actually one of the key intuition pumps or the key thinking tools all on its own. And so this is a book very much about how to persuade others and yourself about difficult matters. There are also tools of discovery. By exploring these vignettes, you, you encounter either problems that you hadn't anticipated or sometimes opportunities that you would not otherwise notice. And they hold our attention. You, you can just refer back to them and at least they give you a, a, a focus on a topic that's very useful. Is the Lee Smolin theory about universes too. We're gonna do it again until we get it right. That, that, that whole universes can in effect be a, uh, rough drafts, semi-rough drafts, penultimate drafts, and so forth, that there can be a process of evolution of universes. And at first, when you encounter this idea, if you're like me, you're sort of cross-eyed and you think, this is just too extravagant. There can't be any way of taking this seriously from the point of view of science. And that's an important point. We, you know, I'm a philosopher. I'm not a scientist. And one thing I know is that imagination is cheap. We philosophers are, love to invent, imagine our universe as possible worlds and think about what's possible and what's not possible, but we're stuck with rather crude tools in a certain way in that beyond l brute logical possibility, which is a very weak notion, we're not very good and we, we don't have any way of keeping ourselves honest. Many people thought of evolution before Darwin. He was not the first person to think of evolution by natural selection, but he was the one who figured out how to bring the empirical demands into the picture in such a way that you had to take the idea seriously. Now, Lee Smolin has done something which I would not, before he wrote, thought possible, and that is come up with the physics that at least requires you to take seriously the idea, which is not that hard to imagine, that there could be an evolution of universes themselves, that there could be an evolution of the very laws of physics that makes biological evolution possible. That doesn't mean that he's shown it's possible, but he has shown that we have to take it seriously. And that's where you can't do that if you're just a philosopher. That's one of the limitations of our trade, is that we don't have the leverage to sort out the imaginable into those things that are imaginable and also that should be taken seriously. For that, you need, you need to make the game harder. You need to do some serious work so that people have to say, yeah, okay, that, that's a possibility we have to take seriously. Let's go back 10,000 years to the dawn of agriculture. At that point, human beings around the world were beginning to domesticate animals and plants, of course. And at that point, our species, Homo sapiens, and these are, of course, entirely modern Homo sapiens. At that point, 10,000 years ago, if you put them on one side of a balance scale, together with their pets and livestock, all the domesticated vertebrates on one side, including us, and you put all the rest of the terrestrial vertebrates on the other side, animals, not the insects, not the worms, not the fish. He calculated that at that time, 10,000 years ago, we and our livestock accounted for a fraction of 1% by weight of the terrestrial vertebrate biomass. What do you think? the percentage is today. 
Any guesses? 10 percent. Over 50. 99, are you kidding? No, it's 98. It is 98. We human beings have engulfed the planet. This is one of the most astonishing biological phenomena that has ever happened. And here's what Paul said about this. Over billions of years on a unique sphere, chance has painted a thin covering of life, complex, improbable, wonderful, and fragile. Suddenly, we humans have grown in population, technology, and intelligence to a position of terrible power. We now wield the paintbrush. I've highlighted the technology and intelligence because those are the thinking tools. The only difference between us and our ancestors of 100,000 years ago is the thinking tools. We got the same genes. We got pretty much the same digestive systems, the same muscles, the thinking tools, the same brains. The thinking tools have changed us and made all of this power possible. It is the, the source of our power, which raises a sort of chicken egg problem. Did evolved tools make us smarter, or did we evolve to become smart enough to make tools? And like all good chicken and egg questions, the answer is yes. <laughs> it's a co-evolutionary bootstrapping process where you have a little evolution, uh, makes us smarter, and then we can be smarter about making tools. We be can become self-conscious about the tools we make. Our ancestors weren't self-conscious. They didn't invent words. They didn't coin words. They just found themselves using words, and it made them smarter. Suppose you were out in the meadow, and you see an ant that's climbing up a blade of grass. Climbs and climbs. If it falls, it climbs again. Climbs and climbs until it gets to the very top of that blade of grass. Sort of like Sisyphus rolling his rock. It keeps climbing up. You think, what is this ant doing? What benefit accrues to the ant? If you ask yourself that question, it turns out you're asking the wrong question. No benefit accrues to the ant at all. Well, then what is this colossal expenditure of energy for? Is it just a fluke? Yeah, it's just a fluke. It's a brain fluke, a lancet fluke. It's a small parasite. Brain worm, if you like, has climbed into the ant's brain and lodged there and is now driving it like an all-terrain vehicle up a blade of grass because it the fluke has to get into the belly of a sheep or a cow to continue its life cycle. That's pretty spooky. It's not, it's not a, a, an isolated case. There are, in fact, many parasites that manipulate their hosts. These are sort of spooky cases where we have a sort of hijacker, that, a parasite that infects the brain of a host and induces suicidal behavior, behavior which has no benefit at all uh, to the, to the genetic fitness of, of the host. And you might ask yourself the question, gosh, uh, does anything like that happen in us? <laughs> Pretty spooky. Well, I'd like to remind you that the Arabic word Islam means submission. It means surrender of self-interest to the will of Allah. What are these? These are ideas to die for.